happy to have Renopo back with us again. It's been a long time. Long time. And Renopo is the two new books that he has, we just mentioned on Europe and Asia, are, are also at the front counter. He's also done the introduction to um, When We Rule, which was by Robin Walker, an English scholar, um, a book that really gives a great survey and overview of black history. John G. Jackson's classic from 1938, Renopo has the introduction in that. And then um, Black Classic Plus Press, one of the best publishers in the country, um, republics Marcus Garvey and the Vision of Africa, a collection of essays that John Henry Clark um, compiled and published in the 60s. And Renopo has done a new introduction to that. So we have all of that. We also have some DVDs that are available to you, but please welcome our old friend, Professor Dr. Renopo Rashid. It's been a long time since I've done a presentation at Essawan or a program with uh, Essawan, and they've always been uh, my favorite bookstore in the world. It's a real, real special institution that we're in right now. So it's really an honor for me to be here. And also, um, to launch um, these two new books. Now, these books are, are new. Um, the book on Europe was actually first published in November 2011, and the one on Asia was published in November 2012, but they were pub they're published in London by a small African publishing house called Books of Africa. And the Europe book came out and it sold well, but the Asia book, we rushed it, and it came out in November and it was very poorly formatted. There were lots of typos. I did. <laughs> it, was, it was very troublesome. So we finally reprinted them, revamped them, reformatted them, and they're very, very, very nice. Um, the last 10, 12 years or so, you know, I lived in Los Angeles in the 60s and 70s and even 80s and early 90s. And then I moved away, I think, for 12 years to San Antonio. and. Um, during that interim, interim, I traveled a lot. I traveled all the time. And I didn't do a lot of scholarly writing. Plus, we had more or less lost Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. And Ivan had begun to uh, deteriorate physically. Do you know Ivan Van Sertema? Yeah. Ivan is the author of a book called, a seminal work called They Came Before Columbus. And he's the editor of a publication called The Journal of African Civilizations. And that journal actually became a publishing house. And so they did books that are hard to get in some cases. Now, I hope you have books like The Golden Age of the Moor, um, uh, African Presence in Early Europe, African Presence in Early um, uh, America, Great African Thinker, Shake on the Joke. And I worked in all of those books. I think there were 12 or 14 anthologies. And except for the first one, which was just before my time, Blacks and Science, I worked with Dr. Van Sertema in all of those publications. And so I got used to writing on a regular basis, and I got used to writing in a kind of a scholarly vein. And then I went through a phase where I just traveled all the time. I think three or four years ago, I set my record in one calendar year. I think I visited 28 countries in 12 months. Okay. And um, so now it's refreshing. It's nice to actually be able to see my books coming back out again. And these are two books that I'm really, really proud of. So I'm going to show you the pictures from the books, uh, most of them anyway. And most of these, at least a lot of them, especially in Asia, are originals. Now, the book on Europe will start first. Oh, let me do something. I know I'm excited. But I'm, I'm 58 years old. Are there anybody, is there anybody older than me here today? I have your permission to begin. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, the Europe book deals with the African presence in Europe from the very beginning until uh, about 1900. The Asia book deals with the African presence there from the very beginning into modern times. So that's the major difference. So let's look at antiquity now. Now this image right here is an image of, you could say, I think what the first people who walked out of Africa into Europe looked like. And this is a statue about four inches high of what's called the Venus of Wellendorf. This is a statuette found in, I think, either 1904 or 1908 in Austria. And a lot of us uh, take note of the hair. And these, this sister looks like the people that we call the Khoi or Hottentots in Southern Africa. So 
throughout early Europe, say from about 25, 27,000 years ago until maybe 5,000 years ago, you have these small statuettes of clearly black women. And it's my argument and the argument of many that this is how God was first portrayed in early Europe. God was portrayed as a black woman with big hips. This one, for example, I photographed in the um, Natural Hist National History Museum in Budapest, Hungary. And this one is from Greece. So that's how we wanted to start. And you can see the uh, physical similarity here. These are the very people that I'm talking about. Now we move from that very quickly um, to the African presence at the forefront of European civilization. And the place, I should have had a map here, but I'm only using the photographs from the book. Normally I would have maps. But the place where we first find civilization in Europe is not even really in Europe itself. It's on the island of Crete, which is in the Aegean Sea, between Africa and the Greek mainland. And Crete, a civilization there, began to flourish about 3,800 years ago. And you have an African presence there, too. This is a shell inlay of a black man from Crete about 3,700 years ago. And this is in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University. It's about this big. And then here's this one right here. This one is called the Captain of the Blacks. Wow. And this is in the Archaeology Museum in Iraklion in Crete. Wow. And there's no real explanation given here. The language has really not been deciphered. But it's, let me see if I can make it a little sharper. I'm looking at it on the computer. Can everybody see pretty well? Mm -hmm. Yeah? All right. It's not so sharp. Um, ah, well, I wish we could make it sharper. I shouldn't have said anything. Let me move it back a little bit. But I asked, so I must have wanted to know. Let me see if we can make one more adjustment, and at least we'll make it straight. If Africans could build the pyramids, I could take my time and do this right. <laughs> no, we're not a people that's used to doing shoddy things. Okay. Is that better or worse? I'm going to keep going. Now, I'm in a place called Crete. I think it was my second visit to Greece. I'd always wanted to go there. I flew from Athens to Crete. I went to the archaeological sites, but the big highlight for me when I travel is always the archaeology museum or the fine arts museum. That's it. And I am excited about seeing things that I haven't seen before and excited about seeing things that I've only seen in books. I had seen this one in books. And there was the actual piece right in front of me. I think I must have photographed it 30 times or so. Now, it's called the Captain of the Blacks, but we're not exactly sure why. I hope this brother isn't running from some white folks or something like that. There's a mob after him or something. Now, this one is from the Hellenistic era. It's actually not in Greece. It's in Western Turkey but it's during the Hellenistic era or the era following uh, Alexander the Greek. Now, I strongly believe in reparations. My only issue is how we're gonna get them to pay up. That's my concern. It ain't whether I'm for it, but what kind of stick we need to make them pay, because morality will never force the issue. Now, when it comes to reparations, what do we want? This is what I want. I've cleared off a space on my coffee table just for this. This is about 2,000 years old. It's black marble. And look at those locks. It's in the British, not the British Museum, but the Brooklyn Museum of Fine Arts. This is a beautiful piece of an African in, the, in Hellenistic Turkey. This one is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And this is a bronze image of a black man in Greece about 450 BC. I'm very big on the African presence in the Greco-Roman world right now. In fact, I stayed up late last night thinking about going to southern Italy and Sicily to see what's over there. One of the things I noticed, though, is that African people were never invisible. If you look at TV, for example, and you look at antiquity, usually if you see any black people at all, they're going to be what? Slaves. But there were Africans in all of these places. There were Africans at the Trojan War. 
there was an African in King Arthur's round. The baddest of all the knights of King Arthur's round was a black man named Sir Morian. Black samurai, black shoguns. But we don't see those images. But there were black people who were very well known in Greece. There were black communities in Athens and Corinth. So the Greeks were very, very familiar with, with the African image. So this is from ancient Greece. And then you have these. Now these are called Janiform heads or Janiform bosses. And they all come from Athens and they're also about 450 BC. And I've seen about 20 of these. And usually you have the face of a black man with nappy blonde hair. And quite often there's a Caucasian woman on the other side. Now what that represents, I'm not sure. These are from all over Europe. Now here's one, this is in New York, just the brother. And again, I think this is in uh, London or Berlin. Here's an image of a brother in the form of um, a perfume bottle in the shape of a black youth. This is from a place called Capua in Italy a couple thousand years ago. Here's one I found in Hungary. And this is an image. You know, I'm in this museum. I'm in Budapest. I only knew one black person in Hungary. One. I went there, I did most of what I wanted to do and more. But my flight was not until about one o'clock in the afternoon, what am I to do? There was one museum that I had not seen. So I went to the museum and one of the things that's different about those museums, not only do you have to pay a fee, but you also have to pay an extra fee to use a, ca a camera. So I wandered through the museum and didn't see much and then two little pieces called me, seemed to call me out. And this is one of them, this is from Rome. I don't know the date, but this is an image of a black youth playing the pan uh, pipes or flute. This one is in Berlin. The Germans were the first big European Egyptologists. They stole a lot. They stole a lot from the Nile Valley, from Nigeria. The Germans stole a lot. And they have at least three Egyptian museums in Germany alone. The biggest one is in Berlin, and it's nice. So here you have a very small pendant right here of a black person, like on a scale, a weight. This is in the Antiquities Museum. And this is Septimius Severus. This is the uh, emperor of Rome born in Libya in April 146. Now, some people will argue, even though there's a book called Septimius Severus, the African Emperor of Rome, whether he was an African or whether he was simply a Roman in Africa. But he spoke a distinct African language and the Romans, his contemporaries, nicknamed him Hannibal's Revenge. And this is the only known painting of him. Most of the images of him show him in, uh, with, in the likeness of a person he considered his model, a man named Marcus Aurelius, a person called the Philosopher King. So he becomes a senator, he heads the Roman legion, and in 193, he actually becomes emperor of Rome. He went back to Africa in 199. He did a tour of Kemet. He sailed on the Nile. He looked at the pyramids. He went through Luxor and Karnak Temple. I can imagine that. If you've ever been to Egypt, you know what I'm talking about. And he had this painting done there. This is called a Tondo painting. And this is the African-born Emperor of Rome, Septimius Severus, who founded the Severan dynasty. Now here's one, this is in Herculaneum. And I saw this painting in a museum also in Berlin. And this is called Hercules in Search of His Son. This is Hercules right here. And this is from a villa in Herculaneum, the city that bears his name. This is Caracalla, the um, successor of, of Septimius Severus. He reigned for 10 years. He was murdered by the Praetorian Guard. And one of the things, and you can begin to look at these in terms of the noses. I'm really big on these noses now. What's up with that? Um, he uh, gave citizenship to a lot of different people. So he was very popular, Roman citizenship. But he was murdered by the Praetorian Guard. And this is the last representative of that dynasty. This is the um, Severan dynasty. 
and this brother's name is Alexander Severus, who was murdered in 235. Now this is in a museum that I had no anticipation of going to. I was in Switzerland. I had an extra day. So I took, uh, I got my nerves together and I went by myself. I took a train to Munich, Germany, which has a reputation of neo-Nazism. By myself, didn't know anybody, had never been there before, right? And I get there and I went, I found an Egyptian museum and it seems like there was another museum I saw too. But I figured I'd done what I set out to do and uh, I was in a taxi on my way back to the train station because I didn't want to wander around alone. Didn't know what I would run into. And I'm talking to the taxi driver. I think she was a, a white woman who spoke good English. And we were just chatting. And I said, you know, I told her what I was doing. My train didn't leave for four or five hours. And I said, oh, I'm so interested in museums. I said, are there any museums around here maybe that I don't know about? And she said, oh, yeah, there's one. We're passing by it right now. And I said, pull over. And that's when I got out and I found this right here. Now I thought that these images were replicas. You go some places and you have museums where they're not the real thing, they're hollow. They're like some sort of plastic. And I thought that's what these were for a while. And I went up and walked to one and I knocked on it like that. Those museum officials went ballistic. They said, what are you doing? And I said, it's not real, right? They said, of course it's real. I thought they were going to escort me out of there. But I got these. Isn't that nice? I love that. Now, this is an African pope. This is St. Victor, not St. Victor the First. His name is St. Miltiades. There's at least three African popes. We talk about them in the book. This is an African sculptor at Rome, a man named Memnon, a sculptor. And then, of course, there's a nice chapter on um, the Black Madonnas of Europe which are absolutely fascinating to me. And this was the first one in Europe I saw. This one is in Moscow, in the Kremlin, <laughs> in the Soviet Union. And this one is the Black Madonna of Paris. Wow. This one is Our Lady, of, no, Our Lady of the Pillar, Notre Dame de Pillar in Chart. Now the question is, why are they black? Why would they be painted black, even though the features are largely European, you would probably argue, in places where very few black people live? And so people have said that it's really not ethnic, it's symbolic. But what would it symbolize? There's another school of thought that they actually represent, they're nothing but depictions of Aset and Heru. But they are not the originals. These are so important that they were actually, in some cases, carried before armies in battle. They are miracle workers. And so they were damaged over time, so these are not the originals. But they're absolutely fascinating to me. And then some of them have telltale signs, like the little afro on baby Jesus' head. Or the little nappy head, uh, the little nappy afro right here. Now, you have to say these things because when you question the people in the church, you get the oddest answers. They are black because they're black, as if to say, leave me alone and make that your last question. <laughs> this one in Russia, I went in there and I had a camera in my hand and I had to actually climb up a scaffold to get up there and take a picture. And a little Russian woman in the church made it a point to come to me and say, you know, it wasn't always black. <laughs> now she made it a point to single me out in her best English and say, it wasn't always black. And I said, but it's black now, isn't it? And so she didn't quite know how to respond to that. So she backed off for a minute and she said, well, it used to be white, but the people painted it, used bad paint and it turned black. And so I said, and that's how Jesus got that little Afro too. And then she just walked away from me. Now, I love this one right here, this is beautiful. This is about 500 years old at the Church of Our Lady of the Good Deliverance. And she's got the national colors of France. This is the black virgin of Paris. She's got red, white, and blue. And she's got that flower, what is it, the fleur de lis? That the New Orleans Saints football team has. And the scepter of France. This is the national figure in Paris. All right. This one is in, um, in uh, Spain, Montserrat. All right, this is my favorite. I took this picture, this is an original. This is, um, 
the Swartz Madonna, Our Lady of the Hermits, Our Lady of the Dark Wood. And this is in Eisendown, Switzerland. Now here in this case, I took as many pictures as I wanted to, even though a sign says strictly forbidden, but nobody stopped me. Look at this magnificent picture. Pitch black. And look, look how muscular little Jesus is there. I'd hate for him to hit me. This is the least Africoid looking one. This is the one, in my opinion, this is the one in Poland. But they call it the Black Madonna. And this is another place I went all by myself to go to the museums and go there. I was in Poland for five days. And in that five days, I saw four black people. And I saw three of them at one time. It's a lonely place for a brother, believe me. OK. This one is in Luxembourg at St. John's Church in the Grund. So I have a group I'm taking to Europe in October. And I'm going to show them these in some of the museums. Next year, I'm taking two groups, one to Spain and Morocco, to more Spain, and another to Cameroon. So if you're interested, make sure you give me your contact information. All right, let's go. This is um, a British colony now. This is Gibraltar. This is, where, this is a fortress of Tariq. You may have heard of Tariq. He is an African Muslim. He's a Moor, and he leads the army from Morocco to Spain in 711. This is Africa over here. And on the other side is Spain, and Gibraltar is right in the center. Gibraltar means the mountain or hill of Tariq. Now, this is where the Africans stopped on the way to Spain. And these are Moors in Spain playing chess with a white servant. This is from what is called the chess book of Alfonso the Wise. This is the flag of Sardinia and the flag of Corsica. And this you've probably seen. Y'all probably, a lot of y'all are familiar with these pictures. Uh, this one is, uh, was the uh, coat of arms of the most recent pope with the Moorish king. This is from Prague and Czechoslovakia. And this is an image of a Moor in chains. Now the Moors dominate Europe beginning from 711, okay? But um, Moorish dominance came to an end. And in 1492, the forces of Ferdinand and Isabella of Aragon and Castile, um, the Moors capitulated to them in a place called the Alhambra. Hey, sister, how are you? And um, they capitulated to them, and Moors scattered all over Europe. So this is an image of a Moor in chains in Prague in the Czech Republic. And each one of these has a story. Each one of these photographs, there's an adventure and a story behind it, like this one. This is Saint Maurice. The name Maurice means like a Moor. Maurice was a Christian saint and also a black knight. He was the head about, according to the story, about 1700 years ago, he was the head of a Theban legion, an Egyptian um, military contingent under the employ of the Roman army. And he was sent to suppress an uprising near Switzerland. And when he got there, he found out that the people that he was going to fight, suppress, kill, the Romans have a term they introduced called Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And it basically means create a desolation, and then you have peace. Kill everybody, and then you don't have, that's called Pax Romana. And so he was sent to Switzerland to put this uprising down. And he says, oh, these are Christians too. I won't fight them. And he disobeyed the order of the Roman emperor. And the Roman emperor was so angry that he had uh, St. Maurice beheaded, decapitated, and a lot of members of the army. And these were called the Theban Legion. And St. Maurice became the object of a cult in Northern Europe for hundreds of years. And this is a statue of the black St. Maurice in Magdeburg, in East Germany, done in 1240. Now, I have seen this picture probably for 30 years, and I always wanted to see the actual piece. But every time I went to Germany, people would tell me, Renoko, whatever you do, don't go over there. White people in Germany, black people in Germany, they said that's where the neo-Nazis are, the skinheads are there, it's not worth it, you're subject to get killed, people have been known to be beaten to death in broad daylight, you know, if you get on the train, a bunch of skinheads are subject to get on there 
and you're at their mercy. Don't go. So the last time I was there, I went. I got a, a white Turkish taxi driver, actually in a brand new black Mercedes limousine, to drive me across from Western Germany into Eastern Germany to photograph this statue. Now that was a dream come true. I told this guy, look here, man, I want you to keep a steady speed going on the freeway. If you see anybody that steps across our path, you put the foot on the gas and I got a big tip for you. Come into church with me. Oh, I was, it was an adventure. This is St. Maurice in Magdeburg, Germany. All right. And then you have a whole section here. And this is something else I'm very big on, on the African presence in the art of Renaissance Europe. And these are images of, this is called the Adoration of the Magi. These are the three kings who came to pay homage to the Christ child in the manger in Bethlehem. And in the European Renaissance, it was common to portray the youngest of the three kings as an African, as an Ethiopian, and also the one farthest away from the Christ child. And so in the book on Europe, we use four originals. This one is in the Prado in Madrid, and so is this one. Now this is another strange museum, the Prado, which could be called the National Museum of Spain. It's the Fine Arts Museum. They tell you no photography. They make that very clear. But they don't take your camera. Now you know, if you've got a camera in your hands and you see something that looks good and you come from halfway around the world, you are gonna probably in all likelihood sneak and connive and find a way. And that's what I did. They were mad. They were mad. I think I know how to push these white people just before they called the police. <laughs> I didn't know, really? No flash, you can't use a camera? I thought for sure. This one is in Baltimore. Now this one looks more masculine. These two look, but this one looks more masculine. And this is my, is my brother sharp or what? Now that is a sharp, sharp brother right there. Uh-oh, let's see. Look at how he's dressed. He got, there's something about black people. He's got that hat cocked to the side and the feather <laughs> matching his gloves. <laughs> this is 500 years ago in the Renaissance. This is in the Detroit Institute of Art. That brother is sharp. Here's one at a, a, a church in a place called Sharp. This is a black executioner. And this is from the judgment of Solomon. You know the story that Solomon is a wise man. So these two women who have, uh, are both claiming, that's my baby. Nobody's gonna give up. So um, they go to Solomon. He says, okay, I got a solution for you. We'll cut the baby in half. And you keep half and you keep, and everybody be happy, right? And so the idea was the true mother would actually surrender. But the executioner, according to the tradition, was a brother with nappy blonde hair. There goes that nappy blonde hair again. This is a black knight. And he's a Norman. I think this is about six or 700 years old too. And this first came to us through the work of J.A. Rogers. There's one seat right here. If somebody wants this one. There's one seat. How are you? What's up, brother? Oh, good, 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 good. You don't have to apologize for that. We want them here. We want them here. Are there any other children? We have two. Who else? Can you all see? You want to come to the front? You could come sit on the floor if you want to. You guys are all right? Are there any sisters in need of a seat? Because I know some of these brothers wouldn't mind getting up for a sister, right? Well, I'm not gonna to respond to that, okay? <laughs> now, this is John Blanc, and this is uh, the personal trumpet player of King Henry VIII. He won a music festival in Westminster, England in 1511. His name is John Blanc in Tudor, England. Now, these go well when I'm in England doing presentations there, because most Africans don't know any more about their history than we do, and that's pretty sad. 
Now this is the mother of a man named Alejandro de Medici. And Alejandro de Medici was the first black head of a Western government in modern times. He was the reigning Duke of Florence in the 16th century, and this is his mother. His father was a cardinal who eventually became a pope. And this is Alejandro de Medici right here. This is in the um, Florence Gallery of Art. This is his daughter down there. She's light, but that's showing up for some. We also, in the book, talked a little about um, St. Benedict the Moor. Now, St. Benedict came from the Italian or Sicilian area in terms of uh, the African contingent there. And he came during the enslavement period. St. Benedict the Moor. And finally, let's wind down on Europe and we'll do the pictures on Asia. This is Charlotte Sophia. Now, this was the Queen of England at the time of the American Revolution. She, it, many scholars, black and white, argue that she is of Moorish ancestry. She comes from Prussia, from Germany, actually from a, um, a principality called Mecklenburg. And she and George III had 15 children. She's an ancestor of Queen Victoria. Charlotte, North Carolina is named after her. Now there are many images of her, some a little more Africoid than others. Now here's a, an example where, again, another museum story, where I saw this, I wanted to see this for a long time. This is in the National Gallery in London. I finally found it after much effort, and I started taking pictures, and after I walked away, one of the museum officials told me, sir, there's no photography, but I had taken my pictures. <laughs> so I learned over time, if you're in a museum, don't ask if you can take pictures. Take the pictures, and then if they tell you to stop, hopefully you've been shrewd enough to get the ones that you already wanted. This is Alado Equiano who corresponded with her. This brother was born in what is now Nigeria. And he wrote a bestseller in England in the 18th century. He was a gentleman. He won his freedom and wrote a book about it that became, that railed against the evils of enslavement. His name is, he's also called Gustavus Vasa. This is Adolf Baden. This hangs in, the, supposed to hang in the Liechtenstein Museum in uh, Vienna, Austria. When I went there, it was not on display. Nobody could tell me anything about it. Now this brother, also from what is now Nigeria, ended up uh, around Vienna in a place called Liechtenstein, and he, was, uh, he worked for a royal family, and he became the educator of a hereditary prince. And he was a close friend of Mozart, and he and Mozart joined the same elite Masonic Lodge at the same time. Now after he died, his body was stuffed like an animal by a taxidermist and put on display. This is the Chevalier de Saint George, also known as Joseph Boulogne, who was the son of an African woman, supposedly the most beautiful woman on the island of Guadeloupe in the Caribbean, and a French nobleman. And he grew up in France, and he excelled in everything that he did. He became the best swimmer, the best uh, composer, the best swordsman. He was so good as a swimmer, he could swim in his head with one hand tied behind his back. He is called the Black Mozart, but Mozart actually came to him to ask him for a job. He set the trend in fashion. He was a confidant of Marie Antoinette. What is my point? Is that African people have always been visible. We've never been invisible. And then this is my favorite. Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, the father of Russian literature, of Cameroonian heritage, who had, it is said, a vocabulary of 20,000 words who was the Russian equivalent to Shakespeare, who wrote in Russian at a time when most Russians were writing in French. He was relative, Hotep, brother, he was relatively dark-skinned. And the theory is his mother pushed him away because he was a little bit dark. So he was raised by his nanny, who was a Russian peasant woman, who taught Pushkin the sufferings of the masses of people. And so Pushkin wrote in Russian, and he wrote in a way that any human being could appreciate. One of his short stories, 
It's called the Queen of Spades. And it's just about Russians who sit around all day playing cards. Funniest thing you ever read. And then he, he, wrote, in pro, he wrote in poetry. He has a poem called, I Loved You Once. And it goes, I loved you once and my heart will not be still. And it's about a man, I'll say a brother, who's out one day and he sees a woman that he had had, um, he had been madly in love with at one point, but it didn't work out. And he sees her unexpectedly. And so that evening he writes to a poem, he says, I loved you once and my heart will not be still. And he goes on to say, but don't worry, I'm not gonna bother you, but it's something I wanted you to know. Now who can't relate to that? Who has not been in a relationship that didn't work? That doesn't mean you cease to love that person. And he says, the embers of that love still burn in my heart. Pushkin could capture the popular imagination. He was a brilliant brother, and he gloried in his African ancestry. So we write about Pushkin in the book. A statue of Pushkin I saw in Moscow in 99. Pushkin's library kept just the way it was the day he died. His favorite possession, an inkwell in the form of an African. And here I am in Russia in 1999, about to give a presentation at the University of Moscow behind the bust of Pushkin. <laughs> and this is Alexander Dumas, whose grandmother was Haitian. And this is the brother who, he, who saw himself as a brother. He identified himself as a Negro. He was nicknamed the Mulatto. He wrote the Three Musketeers, the Count of Monte Cristo, the Man in the Iron Mask. He's the person that one fall and off of one. He said, your work may be finished, but your education is never completed. And the expression I use as often as possible, he said, a, a man's mind is elevated to the status of the women with whom he associates. I love that, don't you? Um, you want me to say it again? I was gonna say it, I just needed a little amen from the choir. Uh, a, man, a man's mind is elevated to the status of the women with whom he associates. He, had, he used to have a lot of fun. You know, he was proud of his African heritage. One of his daughters got married, it is said he invited all the Negroes in Paris to come to the wedding. And the bridegroom's family was pretty alarmed at all these Negroes. And they came to them and says, what's going on here? And he says, these are all members of my family. You'll have to get used to it. And that was the way Pus that's the way Dumas was. Now, he was a great storyteller. Here's the last one, two last stories. <laughs> After he spent all his money having a good time, towards the end of his life, he got broke. So he became a gourmet chef, and he wrote a famous cookbook, which he said was the best of all his books. And then as he lay dying, and I love this story, according to, to, to his biographers, as he lay dying, he says, I see death coming towards me, but I am not worried. I will tell her a story, and she will be kind to me. Now, is that style or what? That's Dumas. <laughs> I love it. He's a man who loves his work. And these are the scholars that we pay homage to, especially in the book. This is the great Joel Augustus Rogers from Jamaica, who wrote Sex and Race, Nature Knows No Color Line, World's Great Men of Color, A Hundred Amazing Facts About the Negro. I saw it over there somewhere. You know, so all of these stories, I mean, all of these books by Rogers. Joel Augustus Rogers from Negro, I'm sorry, sister, I didn't hear you. From Negro, Jamaica, I think born in 1883 or 87, maybe 1880. He knew Marcus Garvey and uh, just a remarkable brother. This photograph was taken in 1930. And this is Edward Scobie, another one of our great scholars from Dominica. And he's the author of a book, uh, Global African Presence, and another book called Black Britannia. Great man who also did some serious work on the Haitian Revolution. I knew him. I actually edited some of his work. And here I am with Ivan Van Sertima himself, who we go back. Uh, <laughs> I bet that's the one I was in the audience that night, or that day. This had to be at least 30 years ago. And this was at Compton College back in the day. And Ivan has that horrible looking necktie on. I saw him wear that many a time. And I had a clip on tie. And I think that's probably the last one I had. But the book, Black Star of Europe, that's what we do. We look at the totality we try to of the African presence in Europe from ancient to modern times, all right? So. Shall we take a break or shall we go right into the Asia section?
Okay. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right, here we go. I don't think I'm going to use quite as many photographs this time, but I'll show you some from the book. Let me take a swig of water. Who could tell me where he's from? China. From the Shang Dynasty in China. Now, when I went to China, I was told there were no black people there. I said, okay, point me to some Africans. Never been any here. I said, never, historically, no. And I didn't see any images in any of the museums, in the tombs, in the temples. It's as though there was an ethnic cleansing. And I think it might have happened during the Cultural Revolution under Mao. But that bears further research. Now, Chancellor Williams, the author of Destruction of Black Civilization, a book that set the course for my life, and I highly recommend that book even now, pointed out that at one time there were so many black people in China that they had their own kingdom. What happened to them? So, I mean, Asia opens up an African presence in Asia, many mysteries. This is an acrobat. And this is in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. You can see the black skin, the nappy hair, the balled up fist. I like to think he's given the black power salute in the Tang Dynasty. This is about 1,300 years ago. And I found about three of these now. So I used two in the book. This one and this one in the Smithsonian Museum in uh, Washington, DC. This is from China about 1,300 years ago. And this is from China about 650 years ago. This is during the time of Kublai Khan. So you have at least three distinct um, African presences in, his, in the history of China. You have the African presence in the Shang Dynasty. That's the first dynasty. I think I may have one from the Shang Dynastic period. Right? That's the formative phase in Chinese history. And then you have an African presence during the Tang Dynasty. That's the classical era of Chinese literature. And then you have an African presence in the Yuan Dynasty. And again, these are just a few of the photos. You can purchase the DVDs or get the books, but I'm showing you a few. This one takes us to Cambodia. And this is from Angkor. Angkor is the great classical civilization of Cambodia. You could say all of Southeast Asia. And this figure is called an Apsara. Look at the hair, look at the bronze skin. This is in Southeast Asia. And this was used on the cover of my first book in French. I've had two books, I have two books in French right now, one on Asia and one is a, a series of travel essays. But this was my first book on, on the African presence in Asia in French, which is out of print now. But this is what we used on the cover. And we also use this in the uh, current Asia book that's available today. This is a likeness of a king named Jayavarman VII who is like Ramses the Great of Kemet. He reigned for something like 60 years. He is a magnificent builder. And this is the entrance to a place called Angkor Thom, the city of Angkor Thom. This is inside Angkor Thom. Off from Cambodia. This one is in Vietnam. And the classical civilization in Vietnam is called the Cham Civilization also in Vietnam. Now most of these have been destroyed. There's about 15 or 20 of these statues. I think I've seen all but one scattered in around five museums around the world. I've really been blessed to go and see these in addition to seeing them in Vietnam itself. But during what we call the Vietnamese War, Richard Nixon ordered the bombing of certain areas where the, these temples were located and it did untold damage. That's something I really like to see done. I like to see somebody do a book on um, what happens to artifacts during times of war. I've never seen a study quite like that before. Okay, and this is from Vietnam. Look at these big lips, the big mustaches. The nose is damaged. This one is intact, this one is in Paris, from Thailand from another period in Thailand. Now we go to Western Asia. Now this one is in the Louvre in Paris. 
And this is 3,800 years old. This is from Iran. Now there's nothing on the caption that says black. There's nothing on the caption that says African. But from the moment I saw this, I knew those were black people. I don't know if it's the shape of the head or the shoulders or what. The, you know. <laughs> Am I wrong? Does that look like some brothers or sisters to you, some black people? You feel it too? That head. <laughs> These are people from Judea. This is the first known depiction that I'm aware of in history of the people that we would call Jews. This is 700 BC. This is downstairs in the basement of the British Museum in London. And there's about eight of these. And this is one of them. Another one. This one is from Iran. Here's a statue that I'm fond of. There's about six of these, maybe in existence. I've seen about four or five. I mean, I live for this kind of stuff. It's, oh, very fulfilling. And then to come and show them here. This is an Ethiopian soldier fighting the Greeks in the Persian army about 500 BC. This one is from Afghanistan. This is um, Antar the Lion. This is the father of chivalry, a dashing knight and poet. And the stories that we associate with chivalry didn't come from Richard the Lionheart or King Arthur. They actually derived from this man. Who led, whose mother was Ethiopian and his father was an Arab, who led troops into battle, but wrote love poems. He was a champion of women, a champion of the weak and the oppressed. And this I photographed in Damascus, Syria, in the Medina. I wonder if it's even there now. The tomb of Bilal, the great African Muslim in Syria. I'm so, yeah, in Syria. A mosque of Bilal. I saw a YouTube video with this being blown up about three weeks ago. Bilal was one of the greatest of the African Muslims. He was full Ethiopian. He was the first person to go into the mosque and call the faithful to prayer, the first muezzin. He had a beautiful voice. He lived to be about 90 years old. He was so pious. He was tortured for his faith. And he's referred to as a third of the faith of Islam. He's revered in Islam. This is one I found in Turkey, a black nomad in the Tokapi harem in Turkey. A brother who I'd been seeing all the time was actually Mongolian, but as I did study for the book, turns out this is from 12th century Persia. And this, I also talk about black people in Asia today. This is one of my favorite pictures of me. And here I am, um, historian, anthropologist par excellence, legend in his own mind, Renoko Rashidi, with these African women in southwest Turkey, who said I was the first black person they had ever met who either wasn't from their native land, Sudan, or wasn't from Turkey. Their ancestors were taken from Sudan as enslaved people about 150 years ago during the time of the Ottoman Empire. So I go to Turkey, I went three times in a period of about 18 months, in 2004 and 2005, and I asked, are there any black people in Turkey? And he asked, no. Are you sure? N yes. But you're spending all this money, Dr. Rashidi. Maybe I'll do a little research and we'll see what we can find. Before the day was over, yes, we have black people in Turkey, the tour company told me. And I tracked them down in southwest Turkey. It was an amazing experience. I could spend a whole day talking about that. <laughs> it's an experience, believe me. You're by yourself. You've never been in this area before. You don't speak the language. You look out of place. And then you are asking for black people. <laughs> okay, I found some. I went to, the, I found this sister's house. A little white Turkish boy and a white, my white Turkish driver and guide said, hold it, Dr. Rashidi, wait in the car, which made me nervous. They go to the house, knock on the door, and this sister opens the window. And she looks at me and starts to wave, and I look at her and she's like scratching her eyes, rubbing her eyes, what's up? So she invited me, she didn't say what's up, obviously. <laughs> so she invites me into her house, and there she, and this is a Muslim woman now, and I'm a man and a complete stranger, and she, her granddaughter is there with her great-granddaughter. So she says, wait a minute, or her daughter and granddaughter, wait a minute, and leaves me alone in the house with her daughter and granddaughter. 
and went and got three other sisters, including these two right here. We talked the whole day. They said that they were the descendants of enslaved people. And they said, oh, we heard black people were in America. How did you get there? And I said, this is gonna take a little while. <laughs> and we cried. They don't know our story, just like we don't know their story. Oh, it was just, and I went to see them again about 18 months later. So, so it was wonderful. India, this is in Latma, it's the LA County Museum of Art. This is in the Ajanta Caves in India, an image of the Buddha as a young man. Now, can you get any blacker than that? And here I am in India with the Dalits. This is 1990, yeah, but this trip caused such controversy that I haven't been to India since. Created a ruckus over there. They wanted to know in one of the states where I was supposed to lead a big rally, basically a black power rally, the police wanted to know, what are you doing here? And they took my passport and kept me under house arrest. And after I left India, we were under surveillance all the time. After I left India, I was told that if I went over there, you know, that would be it. That would be the end of the story. But we got off to a good start. This is a reception. I should have known something was going to happen because the first day my group landed there, this was my third trip to India in 1999, there was the biggest earthquake in New Delhi in 100 years. And that set the tone. But that night there was a big reception in our honor and you can see how they adored me, wrapped me up, which is very uncomfortable by the way. And I gave one of the worst presentations I've ever given. I was awful. But I do say I was terrible. I was nervous. I just never got a rhythm. I was awful. So this brother gave a keynote speech. And you know what he talked about? The life and times of Malcolm X. Now here's a man, a black man, an untouchable, who is somehow elevated to a cabinet position, who greets me personally and thanks me profusely for bringing attention to the cause of the black untouchables. And he, gives up, he gets up and gives a talk and talks about Malcolm X, his life and times in India. His name is Dalit Azimile, Palestine, and myself with a brother in Jordan, an African Jordanian. And what scientists say the first people in Asia look like. And a black woman in Nepal, a black untouchable, a Dalit. Book deals with all of this. Black women in the Punjab, these are Sikhs who I stay now in Canada and Ontario, actually in Brampton, a lot of Sikhs, but I've never seen any black ones. These are the people called the Adivasis of India, from the Philippines, Indonesia, and that's where we began. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg, as you can imagine. Asia and Europe are huge places, but these books, I think, are my finest works. Terms of, I think Ivan Van Sertima would be very proud. You say, Renoko, you did good. I'm proud of you. And so this is what we talk about. Now, what I, what I see myself doing in the very near future, I have three other books coming out, hopefully within the next three months. But I'm also working on four other books. And I just want to share the titles, and I'm going to be quiet. And we can maybe have a question and answer period, and I can sign some books if you're interested. I'm working on four new books, in addition to the three books at the publishers right now. <coughs> One is called World's 50 Greatest Africans. Now how do you narrow it down to 50 people from three and a half million years, all over the earth, male and female? That's what I'm gonna do, all right? The other one, great black women. I cannot say enough good things about black women. I'm gonna talk about the black woman as goddess, as heroine, as freedom fighter, the black woman in mythology, the black women who founded dynasties in the Valley of the Nile. I'm gonna do that. The other one will be the African presence in major world museums. You notice I've talked about museums a lot. So I wanna talk about and show pictures of the African uh, artifacts in the Louvre, in the British Museum, in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, et cetera, et cetera. And the other one, which I hope to really get a good jump on this summer, is the global African presence for children, or the global African presence for beginners. I want to write a book that deals with the scholarly content, but I want to write it in such a manner that young people will find it enjoyable and a learning experience. So that's what Renoko is doing. So I'm really, really grateful to have been able to come back uh, to Essawan. It's been too long.
Thank you. I, I hope that you will purchase a book, not only for me, that I'd be happy to autograph, but to support this institution. There are not many places like this in the world, and they are struggling. And we can't afford to take it for granted. We cannot lose these places. Every one of us, and I mean this, should pledge to buy at least one book, at least one book a month from here. If you have it, give it to somebody else. You know, I don't spend time anymore talking about the mean, terrible things white people have done to us. Okay? That to me is a luxury. I'm more interested in what are we going to do to save ourselves. I get tired of black people saying they kept this information from us. The white man lied to us. How come he didn't tell us this? Whose responsibility is it for us to write our history? That's our job. But we not only must write the histories, we must support the historians. And you must support the institutions that support the historians. So it's not enough for me, for me just to get up and give a lot of good information. But we have to be able to apply this in many ways. And we must support this institution and other institutions like it. All right, James? I, 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 I want you to start with questions. Do you know anything about what's happened um, to Ivan Van Sertel's books? With the exception of they came before Columbus, everything um, else is out of print. I may not have that's what I Well, to begin with, um, I think Ivan really signed some bad contracts with Transaction Press. Like that book, African Presence in Early Asia, mm -hmm. I haven't gotten a dime from that book in maybe 10 years. Okay. And they, they sold it for a long time. I don't know if they still do. Not selling it at all. Now, a year or so ago, not even that long ago, I had a brother in a um, publishing house in Paris who's published my books, who wanted to publish They Came Before Columbus and have it translated in French. So I tried to get in contact with Jackie Van Sertima, but no results. So I'm completely in the dark. All of them are unavailable or just some of them? All of them are unavailable except they came before Columbus. Yeah, now you can go online if you want to and spend seven, eight hundred dollars for one of those books. The transaction says yeah. that they have no, they wouldn't tell me. They say there are legal reasons, but they wouldn't. Well, that may be something to do with Jackie, Ivan's widow, but it's a shame. You also forgot to mention you have to eat. Here, yeah, there are three DVDs. There's a Global African Presence, which talks about a lot of what I did today with the pictures, if you want the pictures. And there's another one called Who is the Original Man? Pardon the sexist title. It deals with the African roots of humanity. It's very, very good. Very good. And there's another one live in Egypt. So we have the book on Europe, book on Asia, and we have the DVDs. Uh, Does anybody have a question? Which book has the pictures that you showed today? The, the Europe book has the first section, the ones on Europe. And the Asia book has a second section. So I did show an Asian section and a Europe section. So each one has the books respected to that area. Oh, I definitely want to see those lovely pictures. Oh, yeah, the pictures are, they say pictures speak a thousand words. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, brother. Are the books for the children? Do you know what, what age they're going to be? Well, I tell you this. Like five years old? <laughs> that might be a bit much. <laughs> But this is what I'm coming to believe now. If I can, for every so-called scholarly book I write, and that's a mistake we make sometimes. And maybe I learned that from Ivan. Now, I have an honorary doctorate degree. I am Dr. Rashidi. But I didn't go to the academy like some of my contemporaries did, right? And so therefore, I have, I think, historically overcompensated. I've tried to write books that are so scholarly as if to say, look, I can run rings around you. That's a lot of that's ego. And that means what you do is you miss the audience, you miss, you miss the people who need it the most. So from here on, I pledge any so-called scholarly book that I write, I'll write a children's book to go along with that. But five years old, that we'll see. I'll tell you something else I want to do now. I want y'all to hear this because maybe you'll pick it up. I'd like to see some of our works by our great African scholars, like they came before Columbus, for example, Dr. Van Sertima's book, um, translated into Spanish and Portuguese. Now, the French Francophone Africans got a lot of stuff. They got Sheikh Hunter Job, they got Theophile Benga, they got a whole other set of African scholars. They're not slouches. The Dutch can read English books. 
But if you go to a place like Ecuador or Peru or Bolivia, I, I haven't done it in Colombia, but I've done it in um, other places, especially with those Indians, they don't know anything. All they know is they were slaves. I've done it in Mexico, done presentations and people, big old grown men break down and cry and say, I was never proud to be black before. Brazil is almost as bad. So I'd like to see us take some of these books, translate them into Spanish and Portuguese, and then either put them online, of course, so if you have access to a computer, you can access these materials, but also to publish the books in cheap editions. You see, these are things that we can do. We can build libraries in Africa and the Caribbean. See, a lot of times we take for granted that you have an Esawan bookstore and these kind of bookstores in other parts, they don't have it. When I was in Suriname, none of this stuff. And as a result of that, there's a big fight about identity. When I was in Suriname, I thought I was gonna come to blows with some people when I said they were African. What? African? And they're more African than any of us. But if you tell them they're African, you might have to flee. Be ready to run. So I'm saying that we can do a lot of things. One last thing, I wanna say this. We have to find effective ways to preserve the archives of the scholars. When a historian, a scholar dies, and their archives, their papers, their books, their manuscripts are not preserved, that is a sin. That's a crime against humanity. And for the most part, you can't tell me where the archives are of the great scholars. Where is Chancellor Williams' stuff? I don't know. Now, if that happens to me, I'm going to come back and hunt y'all. I'm, I'm serious. Count on it. One, two, three o'clock in the morning, you're going to hear a rustling. <laughs> it's Renault Cole. I told you, preserve my, but it's also my responsibility too. So that's where the scholar works in conjunction with the community. We have our own university. Who had the next question? I think over here and then we'll go back over here. Yes. Yeah. Which one? Volume 1, Section 8. Mm. I got it in Paris, uh, France in 1963 when I was in the Air Force. All right. But you know, I, I, I read it so much, I can tell you. He has a thing in there that says, well, the Chinese Negroes are black, you know. And I, I would recommend the people to get Volume 1 of that. And Sex and Race, J. Rogers. J. A. Rogers. I mean, that's where, you, that's where I first came across, you know, the people were, was, was this one black or blah, 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 blah. And I mean, it was just fantastic. And also, I went into the Louvre, and when I saw that, you know, that picture of the uh, Black Madonna. Yeah. Uh, my buddy said, no, I said, man, you think that's Jesus? And we said, no. And uh, no, man, that couldn't be Jesus. And a white man took us back down to the American you know, section. Mm -hmm. and that's where I got Jay Rogers. Good. He bought the book for me. Well, you know, Rogers spent a lot of time in Paris. And another, you know, he has a bunch of great books. Sex and Race is three volumes. But my favorite book on the African presence in Europe, and that's why I put the picture there, is the one, Nature Knows No Color Line. And then the biographical sketches, World's Great Men of Color, volume one and two. Who has the next question? Yes. How you doing, brother? Ralph? Good, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, do you think any type of the, uh, the different deep levels of the information that you share will ever be taught in uh, school curriculums for the kids? Only if you guys make it so. I'm saying that um, we seem to expect other people to do these things for us. Now, we're taxpayers. We live in a community. Our children go to these schools. That seems to me that we should be willing or prepared to exert our influence on what goes on in those schools. So if we make that so, it'll happen. And also, teach it after school and have a Saturday program and an after school program. I get that a lot, I keep telling you. I, I just, at a point in my life now where it just seems like, speaking generally, we just expect other people to do for us. Now I don't know if that's a result of, um, well, I, I won't even go there, I started to say that, and then I caught, I bit my tongue. But it's like we're very dependent on other people in almost every way. We expect other people to do justice to us. And then we're shocked. Oh my God, I don't believe it. He walked. But didn't the same thing happen with Rodney King? And it's been one, I mean, so, but we never seem to quite adjust. 
And then we say the white man is the devil. He lies. He tells us all these things about our history. He said we never did anything to struggle. Write your own books. <laughs> so you're calling him the devil, but you get mad when, you don't, when he writes something you don't like. And we must support the scholars. Imagine what I could do if I got a little bit of support. Imagine. I, I'm very successful at what I do because I love it. I'm passionate about it. But imagine if the community got behind us. Imagine what this bookstore could do. And I know a lot of us are supporting them. That's not a put down. But I'm saying that the bottom line is within our hands lies the key to a great victory. Who has the next question? Uh, yes, sister. How are you? Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of opposition to that truth that he told, especially from the Spanish and Portuguese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to know on an international level, have uh, white people of Europeans, or people of European descent, been more receptive to that truth that he's documented? Some individuals, but generally there's still a great deal of resistance. <laughs> I think it was in 2010. I spoke in three or four big conferences in Africa, two in Nigeria, a big one in Senegal. And these, a lot of it was about enslavement. I was at, there was a conference on the consequences of enslavement. So I wrote an abstract saying the worst consequence of enslavement was that it made us forget we had a history before enslavement. So they accepted the paper. Now, as long as these people were talking about slavery, people from uh, Argentina, from Mexico, white people, white scholars, everything was fine. I sat around and drank beer with these people, laughed and talked. And then I did my presentation. And I showed a picture of an old mech head. Oh, man, why did I do that? It was like they wanted to kill me. These white people from Argentina and Mexico were my deadly enemies from that point. As long as you talk about slavery, you're fairly safe, especially if you are a victim. In fact, you're going to even prick white people's guilt. They might give you some money because they feel bad. But when you start seeing Africans were the first people to move objects in stone, Africans were the first people to read and write that the black Madonna is an African woman, then you rock the boat. And so, yeah, the boat is still rocking, sis. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're welcome. Anybody else? Uh, here and then in the back. You're next. Yes. Well, you said it. Um, you, well, I wanted to ask you. You said that you had difficulty even now trying to find out about the African presence in China. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was at the library earlier before I came here. I was on YouTube, mm -hmm. and I was looking at different videos. I noticed there was a link about the uh, James. Did you need to interrupt? Do you have any more of the um, Asia book? I'd have to run home and get them. Uh, I can't believe all those books are gone. Wow! I had no idea. We have more of the year. No, we can't. Yeah, we have more of the year. Well, SOR is gonna, to my understanding, is gonna be distributing those books. Yeah. yeah. So you can wait for me to go home and bring some, or you could get them beginning tomorrow or next week or whatever. Well, I appreciate the support. China, black people. Yeah, I was saying, I was about to say that I saw a link on YouTube about uh, the black Chinese. Uh huh. I didn't, I didn't check out the link, but it took about two minutes. Uh, I think I've seen that that YouTube clip, and I think it mostly deals with uh, DNA studies. The question is about black people in China, and how I found that area difficult to uh, document. And then there is a, a DNA analysis that came out. Actually, was published in the um, Los Angeles Times in 1998 or 1999, saying most of the Chinese today have African DNA. And so there's a YouTube clip, and I think that's the basis of it. Mm -hmm. Sister, way in the back. Right. Yes. On, on that note about China and Africa. Right.
Well, they're very effective with PR, but um, what I fear is that Africa will replace one colonial master with another. So the power will shift from the west to the east. But everybody has their own interest. And I think we lose sight of that sometimes. What are the interests of African people? Who speaks for us? What's our agenda? What's our program? I think we have a deeply, we, we don't seem to want to be a race first people. We, the whole world, can we all get along? We don't seem to have an agenda that drives our community. It's like we're afraid of making white people mad. Or we're afraid of being accused of being a racist. I'm a race man. I believe black men should marry black women. I'm strong on that. I think we need to, I think we need to spend money in our community. Tip the black waiter more money. But when you say that, people tell you you're racist. Yes, sister. All I know is I said, I put out, but you also a Facebook friend of mine, brother. Good. I put out on Facebook for us to start going into our communities and why, because of the decision on the Trayvon Martin murder case and that so called white boy, whatever he is, got off to start buying again, boycotting. The bigger stores, particularly chains, Walmart's is having problems right now. Your, your employees are going out on strike. I have going out on strike. All the fast food chains, uh, the employees are going out on strike and stop boycotting these people, stop buying from eat at black restaurants, buy from stores like this. I'm asking people to join me and others in the worldwide boycott of these uh, people and their uh, so-called goods. See, this sister thinks yeah. big. Worldwide. <laughs> yes, my sister. Where's the next question? Way in the back, yes. You, you've done work, and thank you so much, on the uh, indigenous blacks of the Andaman Islands in yeah. southern South India. Yeah. Do you know anything about their ties to the roots of uh, Sanskrit, the oldest and ancient? No. I don't, I don't, I, why would you ask that question? Because I'm a yoga instructor. I do like yoga. I don't think that they would have any ties, but I would certainly, and you probably know about this, I would think that the blacks in the mainland, like the Dravidians and others, would have ties. Right. They're, they're, they said the the, uh, the Andaman Island uh, folks have the uh, like pure South Indian blood, if you will, quote unquote. There was no admixture from the north, so I thought there was maybe that they were the root of the blacks. Well, I, well, I'd have to think about that, but offhand, I would probably dismiss it, saying that they've been there for so long that there's very little connection. But that's an interesting point. One more question. Wow. All right, we're gonna, next question is the highest bidder. Can we start with $10? <laughs> oh my God. Someone has got one? Yes, brother, mm -hmm. standing up, uh-huh. Stand up. And then you can bring up stuff, they can talk to you individually. All right, I'm in a good mood. I ain't intended to go anywhere for a while, so you all can come and talk to me when you come up to sign your books. But wait, let me get to brother's question. Thank you. No, 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 yes. The Ainu? You asked yes, specifically about the Ainu? Yes, sir. I don't think so. The Ainu is spelled A-I-N-U. 
and they're very, very ancient people in Japan. How ancient? I don't know. They are not the first people of Japan. Some people think that there's a resemblance, and it may be that they have two Aboriginal Australians. Other people think that the name Ainu connects them to another name, and that is Anu, a name that we find uh, at the dawn of great African civilizations in many parts of the world. So I, I don't know, there's some argument about that, but I went to Japan, I've been in Japan two or three times, and the first time I went there and I spent time among the Ainu, I couldn't find anything African about them at all. Nothing. But most of the ones I met had straight hair. But it could be that there are different groups of them, and that the ones I saw perhaps are just very mixed and they don't represent the original characteristics. I know what James said, but is there any young person, is there, are there any children with any questions? All right, well, if there are no children, then we will say, I will say thank you so much. I had a great time. And um, I'm sure that we'll be doing this again soon. If you want to purchase a book, that's great, or a DVD, and I'd be happy to autograph it for you and answer any additional questions.